All right, howdy folks. Welcome back to Top Comics Pressing. In this video, what I want to do is talk about this bulb in particular, which is a uh, bulb recommended in the stain removal and whitening book by the Captain Mike crew. And I want to not only give you a little bit of my perspective on this bulb and where I learned about it, but also why I think using this bulb to remove stains and whiten comic books is so important and why it deserves extra special attention and consideration and citation from the community, um, and particularly, again, as it pertains to comic books. So I became aware of this bulb in late 2021 uh, as a member of the Captain Mike Facebook community, and particularly it was Chris Trump on that board, who was one of the admins who was you know, experimenting with stain removal and whitening and had been playing around with a lot of different bulbs and had stumbled across this one. And I'll get to you there in a minute, but what I want to show you is that inside the book here on stain removal and whitening, you know, you very clearly can see that that is the bulb that is used. And it's the bulb that was used not only in the development of the work for what is now called the bled or blue LED process for stain removal and comic book whitening, um, but it's also the one that you can see online. So this is the Captain Mike web page. And here, you know, if you click on this, products list. It'll, it takes a minute to load, but you can scroll down and you can find these blue LED bulbs. And if you click on that, you know, you can very clearly open up the link to Amazon. And again, the blue LED here is specific to the 450 to 460 nanometer range. This is not a UV bulb. This is not a black light. This is a blue LED that irradiates at a very specific wavelength and has a very specific characteristics of being, you know, 36 watts. So it's pretty high power for an LED and it irradiates at a very specific wavelength and frequency. So as somebody who is interested in removing um, stains from comic books, oh, and I'll point out here that this is the book. And one important thing I also want to point out is that this book was published January 1st of 2022. And so this book is under a year old, but it contains, again, uh, very detailed references on this bulb. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is, at least from my perspective, this uh, book was the first time that anybody in the comic book community had put down in writing um, procedures in detail for how to remove stains and to how to whiten comic books and that the use of this bulb is specific um, to the instructions in this book and not only is it important that they were doing this and writing down exactly what the details were um, and you can see here it's instructions on how to make the box it's instructions on how to lay your comic book out uh, but you know to get this kind of contrast from a very clearly yellowed Fantastic Four special to um, one that is much brighter and much lighter. You can see here, it's, this is crediting Chris Trump. But this book also includes what not to do. It includes, you know, distances of your comic book to the bulb. The team spent a bunch of time figuring out how um, intense the bulbs can be and how much light you can continue to bombard that comic book with before you start to see negative consequences. And the reason I bring that up is because there were people in the field experimenting with this beforehand. And I don't think anybody on the Captain Mike team would make the claim that they were the first person to think about using some kind of light with some kind of hydrogen peroxide to either remove a stain from a comic book or to whiten a comic book. That is not the advance that's being claimed in this book. And that is not the core of the intellectual contribution. The two kind of core intellectual contributions are specifically calling out this blue LED that I think is very important. And the second of which is documenting the exact procedures so that this can be readily adopted and consumed by people in the community. And I think in 2022, there was a tremendous explosion of people being able to utilize this. And that is a direct result of the techniques in this book being widely adopted by the people in the comic book community. Now, they might not realize that they were the techniques here. They might have gotten that information from somebody else or seen it on some other channel. But I think unless people have detailed receipts showing that they were using uh, particularly this bulb beforehand. Um, you know, you can probably chase those roots back to this January uh, January 1st, 2022 publication. Now, as somebody who is very interested in doing this, 
myself beforehand. Um, I was experimenting with bulbs and I think a lot of other people were and I can just tell you what kind of bulbs I was using and what kind of problems I had with them and why I think this particular bulb solved a lot of those problems. So the first kind of bulb here that I was playing with was these UV lights that are used to cure nail polish and I had stuck two of these together and put a comic book under it and I was able to get some pretty dramatic whitening and it was doing a pretty decent job at removing stains. The only problem was it was also completely destroying gloss and the comic book clearly looked messed with uh, after I was using that. The next kind of bulbs, uh, you know, I turned to were sort of these grow lights that um, actually have a broad distribution of wavelengths. And the reason that they have a broad distribution of wavelengths is because lights have different chlorophylls. And I covered that in the video I recently uploaded just talking about photochemistry. And so because uh, plants have a number of different chlorophylls. Each of those chlorophylls has their own um, chromophore. Each of those chromophores accepts photons at given wavelengths. And because of that, you want a light bulb that can simultaneously irradiate all of those wavelengths so that the plants can use all of that energy. And so uh, with these lights, I was able to get good results. I would say they were not phenomenal and uh, they had some issues, but in general, they were acceptable. You know, after that, I started looking at different UV lights. So if you just scroll here, you can see, um, and, and that's what people commonly refer to as some kind of UV light. And again, I wanna point out that this is not a UV light. It's specifically visible light. Um, and th these kinds of bright flashlights are still the ones I use to look at restoration. Um, but, you know, the, these sorts of lights you, you can think about lining a light box with as well. Um, and I had played around with some of that. Uh, I never bought any of these sort of more powered uh, UV lights, only because I had already had problems with the, those you used for, um, you know, curing nail polish. And I knew kind of what the limitations were. So people throw around black light. And I want to point out a couple things about black lights, um, one of which is that they are uh, ultraviolet light. So they're going to be UV. And you can see here that there's a table of different um, combinations of, of you know, diodes that lead to different black light. But importantly, this kind of purplish hue that you give off or that you see when using these black lights are typically because um, there's actually a filter in there that kind of limits that light to being UV. And so you get that kind of weird purplish glow because purple is kind of the transition from UV to visible. And uh, most of the time, the, the plastic shield around those bulbs um, ha has that filter built in. Uh, here is a plot of one of the most common UV bulbs that people can buy. So this has an, an excitation maximum or, or lambda max at 370, you can see here. And you can see that there's essentially no irradiation from that bulb past 400, and there's certainly nothing at 450 nanometers. And so you will not get the same effect um, of whitening if you use this bulb that is centered at 450 nanometers versus using a black light that is centered at 370 nanometers. And I believe that these blue lights are much softer on organic molecules. And the reason for that is most organic molecules have chromophores that absorb in the low UV range. That is about 210 to 220 nanometers. As you drift up to 300, most organic molecules uh, kind of stop absorbing because they don't have an electronic excitation band that overlaps with those wavelengths. And so the photons of energy are fundamentally not able to be absorbed by that molecule, and we call them transparent to that wave of life. Uh, once you get up to 350, and especially beyond 400, there's very, very few organic molecules that can actually absorb light in that region. And so I believe one reason why the blue LEDs in particular is so special is because the wavelength of light is so long and the photons are so weak that we're able to selectively irradiate only the molecules that lead to discoloring and yellowing. And I'll get there in a second. Now, one of the other criticisms of, you know, this technique is that we're destroying comic books or causing lasting damage to the paper fibers. Uh, I've got a set of experiments underway and I'm going to uh, consult with some experts there. I don't believe that that's the case. And the reason for that is just a simple gut check. So if you ask Chris Trump, I believe he's pretty honest about saying he got the idea of specifically using blue LEDs um, from going to the dentist and being offered a teeth whitening uh, from the dentist. And so you can see a picture here of a patient with their, their lips open. And th this involves painting teeth with a gel that contains hydrogen peroxide and then irradiating that uh, with high intensity blue LED light. 
And you can read about that on a number of different web pages. So this one is from Healthline. Um, here's one from a dental office that I don't know anything about. They just had some really nice pictures of folks doing it as well. Um, and you can see a little bit more about the process. And importantly, I wanna point out that, you know, to get that whitening, you don't have to have a very dramatic effect. You just have to slightly remove some yellows and some cream tones from that. And anybody who's mixed paint um, and has looked at off-whites or cream tones, um, or gone to a paint store and looked at all the different kinds of white that they offer and sell, knows that it takes just, just a little bit of color to discolor a white. And so on our comic book surface, I think we're just dealing with very, very low concentrations of molecules that happen to be a, a little bit more colored. And so we're just gonna be irradiating those. Now, importantly, I think if the American Dental Association and the Food and Drug Administration is allowing dentists to put the peroxide and blue light in people's mouths, like like this, um, it's probably a good indication that it is relatively safe and does not have, you know, massive uh, physiological effects. And so you can see here in the side effects, really, um, the the most minor or, or most significant side effect generally is just a little bit of irritation. Um, and so you can get that a lot of different ways. And I think the general conclusion is that the combination of hydrogen peroxide with blue LED is actually quite mild. And uh, I'm going to have, again, some experiments here documenting why I don't think we're damaging the core fibers of a paper, uh, but that is going to be a little bit longer coming. Now, um, going back to something here that I want to talk about, and that is, should you... Um, you know, give a reference to this book or not. Um, in my opinion, for those individuals who are using this particular bulb, um, specifically centered at 450 nanometers, and who uh, have developed or started doing this after the publication of this book, January 1st, 2022, I believe the answer is yes. Um, and I wanna make it perfectly clear, I'm not the person who invented any of this. Um, I found out about this from the Captain Mike crew, and I make zero claims that in any way I discovered this bulb or had any really ingenuity for using hydrogen peroxide on my comic book. But if you follow both this channel and my Instagram, you can see I've had some pretty amazing results with it over the last calendar year. And I attribute all of that to the selective use of this particular bulb. And I say that again, because, you know, before I found out about this from the Captain Mike crew, I was using all kinds of other bulbs and I was fading colors. I was generating brittle paper. I was, um, removing gloss or destroying the glossy finish on the comic books. Um, and so all of these bulbs, I think, are inferior to this specific 450 nanometer blue LED recommended here uh, by the group. And other people might say that, you know, this was, quote, common knowledge in the field. Uh, but I want to take a minute to describe what that means academically as somebody who is a former professor and who has spent, uh, you know, over a decade in academics publishing scientific papers. So I've published over 50 papers in some of the world's most uh, preeminent scientific journals. And to me, common use or things that are generally available uh, do not include anything that has been published again for under a year. So at the time of this recording, it is December 12th, I'm sorry, December 23rd, 2022. Um, and this book is under a year old. And so I don't believe it is fair to say that this was generally known in the field. Um, and I'm getting that both from, this is a list of ethical guidelines from the uh, Public Library of Science, which is one of the leading open access, uh, all scientific journals in, in the um, in the in the world and you can see here what to include for relevant citations you can also go to the u.s department of health and services that has the ori as this is commonly referred to but that's the office of research integrity and this is the office that deals with academic misconduct at using the national institutes of health and you can see that they have guidelines here for um you know citations what should be cited and as well as um the importance of citing original uh, observations. And so, you know, the lack of attribution to the people that originally came up with the work is in many ways considered a form of academic misconduct. And at least if investigated academically can lead to repercussions, including of which, um, having papers retracted or grants cut off. Now, th this, uh, 
is only typically it really strictly enforced for things that are repeated and intentional. And I want to make that very clear. If there is an accidental oversight, generally what authors do is they publish an addition and a correction, just basically saying, oops, I'm sorry, guys, I missed that. I didn't mean to omit you. It was an honest mistake. Let me include that in my paper now. And that happens quite a bit. And so those are called additions and corrections. And the most common form of addition correction is either a small typo that had a big impact in somebody's understanding or the omission of a citation or two. And at least in the scientific community, the uh, burden of correctly citing is that of the authors. And so saying, oops, I didn't know about it, or I didn't bother to look that up is inadequate in a scientific field as justification for not citing something. The burden of knowing the field and correctly citing the sources and the discovery, uh, that responsibility lies with the authors. And you can see that on other university web pages. So if you search university at libraries, almost every single one of them has something about guidance. And you can see here the most important guidance that you'll see repeated over and over again is if in doubt, provide a citation. So now I'm um, going back to one last thing here about the light. Really, I think the fundamental reason why these blue LEDs uh, do such a good job at whitening and brightening things, again, has to do because they are blue light centered at 450 nanometers in the visible region, um, they are gonna continuously bombard something with blue light. And remember the colors that we see are opposite the colors that are absorbed. And so if you are irradiating white light at an object, that object is absorbing all of the colors except the one that's bouncing back at you. And so if you are seeing blue, that means the object is absorbing all of that light except the blue, which is being shut back at you. Now the object is therefore absorbing the complementary color and that's what this plot is showing us here. Uh, so this shows that the color will be perceived, that is in, uh, interpreted by the human eye, when a material absorbs in certain regions of the visible spectrum. And so if we go to 450 here, we can see that that is perhaps not coincidentally the maximum for orange light. And that happens to also be centered between yellow and red. And so the simplest and most direct observation for why these blue LEDs are so powerful at doing whitening, whether it be on human teeth, whether it be on stormtrooper action figures or on Millennium Falcons, or whether it be on our comic books, is because when you are irradiating blue, the color that is actually absorbing is going to be orange. Okay, and so, um, that is, if the blue light is being absorbed, the human eye is going to perceive orange coming back at it. And that means um, we are going to be uh, selectively and intentionally targeting oranges, a little bit of yellows, and a little bit of reds. And that explains why the Captain Mike team discovered that red ink transfer is really easily removed by these blue LEDs. And it also indicates why too much exposure to the light that the primary source of damage that we observe is bleaching of oranges, reds, and yellows in the comic book. Okay, and so that is unsurprising to me uh, based on this analysis and based on the knowledge that we are recommending the use of this blue LED light. So just to summarize here, I make no claims whatsoever to be the inventor or the discoverer of either the use of hydrogen peroxide or light to be used on comic books. I do have strong feelings that uh, specifically Chris Trump and more broadly the Captain Mike team deserves credit for introducing this particular blue LED light bulb to the community and that the procedures and techniques outlined in the comic book stand removal and whitening book um, that was published all the way back in January 1st, 2002. Um, do deserve extra recognition because it is the first time this particular bulb was recommended and the first time that a fully documented list of procedures and protocols was made widely available to the comic book community. And I believe strongly that the publication of this book has led to a literal renaissance of people being able to use these techniques broadly throughout the community to make their old comic books look a whole lot better. And I believe that that deserves special recognition and support. And I do not think that individuals should confuse 
these blue LEDs, which are clearly centered at 450 nanometers, which again is a blue light, which can be very clearly seen from the title of this um, presentation. I don't think that they should be representing or confusing that with UV lights or with black lights that have uh, uh, excitations well below 400, and in some cases as low as 330 or even lower uh, nanometer wavelengths. And so that's my summary. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out with questions about the, you know, as, as you have them about this topic. Thank you for your attention and take care.